Okay. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today for the open uh, legal and accounting Q&A. Where else but lend it can you get free legal and accounting advice? So we're really excited today. And um, you know, this is a real open forum. Please feel free to ask away. Uh, and, and first, we're going to have our distinguished panel introduce themselves and talk a little bit about um, uh, you know, what, what they're focused on and what their expertise is. And, and then we'll take it from there. We'll see how this goes. Thanks, guys. Okay, so I'll start. Um, my name is Samuel Hu. I'm with, an attorney with the law firm of Chapman and Cutler. Um, We've been involved in this space for a number of years. Um, we've uh, published a white paper outlining some of the laws and regulations governing P2P lending and online lending. Copy of it, I believe, is we have some available um, at the back here. Um, for today's purposes, um, I'm going to try to help answer some questions that you may have regarding, say, differences between consumer lending and commercial lending. You know, if you have a question about you know, why does Prosper and Lending Club use Web Bank? Um, questions along those lines. But as an overall practice, you know, we're happy to help if you've got questions around securities laws, um, if investment funds, et cetera. So that's kind of where. Uh, Greg Knapp from Opus Fund Services. We're a fund administrator. We've been in the business or with the P2P sector for about three and a half years. Uh, we have about 19 funds uh, on the platform that do quote unquote P and P2P. Um, what we're gonna do is uh, today probably explain to you guys what, what does a fund administrator do for a P2P fund. If there's any questions on that, and then if you have you know, further questions on, you know, we assist with banking, we do fund, um, also investor services, uh, so when you're doing do documentation, whatever it might be, uh, we're assisting in almost all, all those aspects. My name is Scott Budlong. I'm a partner at the law firm of Richards, Kibbe & Orby in New York. I'm a securities lawyer. My firm is focused on all aspects of the financial markets, and we've come to online direct lending uh, largely through our expertise in uh, the trading of loans as an asset class, and also through our uh, historical focus on hedge funds and other private funds. Uh, and so we are working uh, currently with some uh, clients who are putting platforms together, uh, and other clients who are looking at online direct lending as an asset class uh, and starting to uh, put together funds for, for that purpose. And I'd be happy to talk today, uh, address any questions about the securities law aspects of online or peer-to-peer -peer lending, including various elements of the JOBS Act, which are uh, uh, relevant to, to the space. My name is Mike Souza. I'm an audit partner with BDO here in San Francisco. Um, my background has been in the financial services space uh, throughout my career. We um, have been in the uh, P2P space uh, for a few years. Um, we actually are involved in all pieces of it from the fund side to the platforms and then also the originating bank side. So we've, we kind of touch all, all pieces of it. Um, so I'd be happy to talk about uh, some of the issues that we're seeing from an audit side and um, you know, I'll address uh, any other questions as best I can. Uh, my name is Brian Korn. I'm a corporate securities lawyer at Pepper Hamilton, uh, based in New York. Uh, Pepper is a full-service law firm encompassing litigation, IP, and corporate. Uh, our chairman is Louis Free, the former head of the FBI, who uh, is known also for MF Global and the Penn State investigations. Um, we've been focused on peer-to-peer -peer for uh, about two and a half years now. Uh, originally got into the space with a number of investor clients and a number of overseas clients looking to structure uh, investments in in peer-to-peer -peer in an efficient way. Uh, we've since also uh, worked with platform clients and other clients that are looking at, uh, at, at developing an asset class in the space. Um, we've written a paper which is available on our table called uh, Top Five Things You Should Know About Legal and Regulatory Aspects of Peer-to-Peer. Uh, before you do anything else. So if you have not picked it up, uh, I recommend you do so. Um, and I think the focus of my answers today are going to be on uh, kind of what you can sell and to whom can you sell it. And a lot of the questions that the platforms come to us with involve uh, interfacing with investors. And different types of investors have different requirements, whether they're domestic, whether they're overseas. Uh, are investors going to buy uh, a note product on each loan? 
Are you going to raise a discretionary fund and use your discretion to invest in loans? Are you going to pre-fund loans and then try to backfill them with investor demand? Um, and then we've also developed other structures, including a series fund, where if you have investors that want an element of choice in their investments, if they want to choose uh, one loan at a time but still have the protection of a fund and having you not register as a broker-dealer, which we'll talk about uh, the different aspects of that, I'm happy to answer those questions. Um, generally, the, the law and the legal areas in this area break down into three main aspects. The banking and sort of borrower interface, uh, which, which Sam is covering. Uh, the securities law aspects of whether you need to register uh, the securities or whether you're using an exemption from registration. Uh, so Lending Club and Prosper, for example, use the S-1 registration statement. They're filing with the SEC. It's expensive. Um, other platforms are completely using accredited investors, such as Realty Mogul. Um, and then the third aspect is, uh, is your fund interface. And am I a broker when I go out and solicit investments? Uh, am I uh, exempt from broker-dealer registration with respect to my activities? And how do I structure uh, my investor interface in a way that's most efficient, that most meets our investment needs? So I think we'll open it up if anyone has any questions off the bat. Uh, otherwise, we can keep talking. <laughs> yes? Um, I guess for the lawyers, um, I've heard that uh, the SEC has had some buyers. Oh, <laughs> I've heard um, out there that the SEC has had some buyers remorse in the wake of Prosper and Lending Club clearing the S-1 path for the notes and uh, had felt some political pressure at the time with the Jobs Act and, uh, and the door may be closing from the perspective of corporate finance. And uh, I'm wondering if you've heard that or, or if you have any visibility into how corporate finance is uh, viewing the space and also whether enforcement has been active and what their posture might be. I can, I can take that. Um, I've not heard the buyer's remorse um, angle. Um, uh, I think corporation finance is probably expecting, uh, though, that um, a lot of platforms will now take advantage of new Rule 506C, which was um, adopted in, in, uh, in uh, the past, in, in, uh, in autumn 2013, and allows general solicitation uh, in a way that previously would have been inconsistent with a privately placed unregistered offering. And so I think um, it is probably the case that um, Corp Fin and, and, and other uh, regulatory observers are expecting probably at this point with that Rule 506C available that platforms now will go that path rather than taking the S1 path that back uh, prior to 2013 was the only way uh, to solicit the public. Um, and that, that, that starts on the supposition, of course, that a, a platform website um, is a form of general solicitation for purposes of the securities laws. And in terms of your, the second part of your question, the, the, the SEC's regulatory stance, they ha have signaled, the, 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 the SEC signaled on the same day that Rule 506C became effective last fall, the SEC in uh, uh, very much uh, non-coincidental timing issued a bunch of proposed amendments to Reg D, the private offering regime under the Securities Act. And it would make it tougher um, in many practical ways to use Rule 506C. So on the same day that this new freedom was kind of gloriously granted and the sun shone, uh, the SEC uh, ushered in some, some potential rain clouds of its own. And one element of that is that the SEC made a big deal in, in, in announcing those proposals of saying that it had formed uh, a special working group spanning uh, several staff members from several divisions within the agency uh, whose sole purpose is to keep an eye on the use of Rule 506C and to be on the lookout for patterns of fraud, for patterns of investor exploitation. Basically, you got the sense that they'd been charged with going out and finding grist for the SEC enforcement mill. And while that um, working group and that um, potential regulatory attitude is not directed specifically at online direct lending simply because I would expect many platforms to make use of Rule 506C. Um, they will, you should expect that platforms will come within the, the scrutiny of that kind of, uh, that kind of SEC uh, attention.
Does that sound right to you? No, I, I agree with that. I think I, I have heard the buyer's remorse uh, anecdotally. I think that the, the the history of Lending Club and Prosper are important to remember and are not likely to be replicated by any other platform. Um, they started out 2006 and uh, started as an exempt platform, uh, went to the S1 format, and uh, at least in the case of Prosper, were briefly shut down by the government. So. The way that it is working now is that the Prosper Lending Club markets are moving to an institutional and whole loan purchase marketplace. Um, the only notes that are SEC registered are ones that are borrower payment dependent notes that are going out to investors on the retail platform. Um, if you're an institution and you have an allocation through Prosper Lending Club, uh, most likely you are buying through a whole loan purchase agreement where you've agreed in advance to buy certain batches of loans, loans that have certain uh, investment categories uh, and the like. And those are not generally SEC registered because they take the view, and I agree with the view, that a whole loan sale is generally not a security and a whole loan sale to a single party is not a securities offering. Um, I think that if you look at the SEC database, which is called EDGAR, and a lot of you are familiar with that, um, Prosper and Lending Club are uh, very active filers. Uh, they file. Uh, 424Bs, which are prospectus documents, which basically have uh, records of loans that aren't even being offered. They've been funded and offered days ago, uh, and they're being uploaded two, three, four times a day in these 500-page batches. And um, it, it, is, it is costing the taxpayers money, one thing, to run this site to allow uh, what is amounting to meaningless filing and meaningless disclosure, because these investors have already made an investment decision. And so I don't think they want uh, a lot of, of, of new filers taking that tack. Thanks. Uh, Darren and I were actually kind of batting this question around earlier, and it's a, uh, it's a tax law question. So as many of the portals and platforms are, are waiting for title three and looking to perhaps find a way around that, uh, we see some starting to offer a combination of awards, rewards, and securities. So in, in my world, I offer self-directed IRAs. We're allowed to offer those for securities, but not for awards and benefits, as the IRA holder receives a personal benefit, therefore prohibited transactions. So we're beginning to have these conversations with portals that are offering these hybrids. Any thoughts on how that might be approached? No, I've, I've seen, so in the intrastate crowdfunding rules, so the, the rules that allow crowdfunding within certain states, um, what portals that are operating in those states, so there's a, there's a website in Georgia, I think called GroundVest, which is a real estate only Georgia investor site. They, they offer national rewards, so you can still invest in properties. You're not really making an investment. Uh, you're receiving a reward. Uh, but if you're a Georgia resident, then you can actually invest and receive a return on your investment. Um, a big confusion in the Oculus case with Kickstarter was that people investing in the, in the Kickstarter Oculus offering, which was $2 million last year, we're actually making an investment in Kickstarter, in, in Oculus, and when Oculus was acquired by Facebook, a lot of people made a lot of noise saying, well, what's my, where's my exit? What's, and, and, and they didn't realize that rewards crowdfunding, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, Rocket Hub, those are donations, right? Those are not securities. They're not regulated by the SEC. Um, you know, you, you can't engage in overt fraud, but uh, it's, it's not a, a, an investment decision. But um, I, I don't know, are you asking a specific tax question around uh, whether IRAs can do rewards slash equity hybrids? Well, the, the short answer is they can't. So how do you, how would the boards and platforms get around that? Would they either A, just not offer that particular asset class to IRA holders, or is there a way to properly segregate it? I'm not a tax lawyer, but I would expect just from the simplicity and the securities law perspective that they just would not let IRAs participate in that kind of hybrid structure. Yeah, yeah.
Thank you. Sorry, it's a bit of a hike for you. <laughs> I um, uh, apologize if this has already been asked. I, I just joined up, but I was wondering, um, is the old originate and securitize model where originators would originate and securitize and, and the proposed Dodd-Frank rules related to that where the originators are required to have the bottom 5% risk. Uh, in many ways, some of the underwriting and the business models here are similar to Lending Club and Prosper, that they underwrite originate, um, but it's funded by somebody else. Uh, so, so I'm wondering whether it's purely, a distinction purely related to whether they are securities or not, or whether the spirit of Dodd-Frank is broader in the sense that it's related to conflicts of interest between originate and underwrite versus uh, funding. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. And it's a very good question. And if you want to learn more about the securitization of these assets, there's a panel right after this that will be downstairs um, addressing those types of issues. I think there's a few parts to your question. So I'll kind of hit the first one is whether or not a lending club borrower dependent on, I'm just using lending club as an example, but you have an origination of a loan and you issue a security backed by that loan. Is that an asset-backed security for the purposes of Dodd-Frank, thereby requiring somebody to, to hold 5% of the, the risk in that? Um, I don't think that there's an easy answer to that question. I, my personal feeling is that Dodd-Frank and those securitization rules never meant to apply to this type of security. And so I think it's defensible to make an argument that a borrower-dependent note is not an asset-backed security for the purposes of um, the Dodd-Frank risk retention rules. However, when you do start pooling a lot of these securities and then issuing ABS backed by it, then certainly that would fall into that, into that regime. And um, it'll be interesting to see how the funds such as the Eagle Woods and the people that are doing the securitizations, you know, whether or not they're going to be able to retain that risk, whether or not, you know, how they're going to make that work economically. But um, I hope, hopefully that answers your question. But Sam, you would say that the fact that um a product is not an asset-backed security for Securities Act purposes is not necessarily going to mean that it's also outside the risk retention rules. It's possible that you could have a product that's not an ABS on the one hand, but subject to the 5% risk retention rules on the other. No, the, the subject, the 5% the risk retention rules only apply to asset-backed securities. So it, it, you could take the position that like one of these lending club notes is in fact an asset-backed security visits a security backed by an asset, backed by one loan. Right. Um, I, I would make an argument that it's not, and therefore people like Lending Club wouldn't actually need to retain the 5%. On, on and the holdback, oh, when does that start? Uh, I don't think that okay. that's, uh, we don't even know, if the final rules okay. haven't even been adopted, or it'll be two years after the final right. rules are adopted, but the final rules have not yet been adopted. So, you know, uh, is there something specific about the Dodd-Frank uh, that, uh, that that's defined, the ABS is defined the way it is, or is it broadly the spirit of the Dodd-Frank as to, uh, you know, the, the conflict between um, origination and funding? Or there's something about the definition that makes it completely different? Uh, the, the definition of it is actually, you know, at least is, is fairly clear. It's a, it's a security that's you know, an asset-backed security. Um, so I think that you know the argument that, that I'm making here about why a specific one loan backed by one or a security backed by one loan isn't an asset-backed security. I, like I said, I think it could be argued that it actually is. There are nuances. For example, people will make an argument that an asset-backed security needs to be issued by what's defined as an issuing entity, and an issuing entity needs to actually hold a pool of loans, and because these securities are not backed by a pool of loans or just backed by one loan, um, you know, you can make an argument that that's not an asset-backed security. I, I, again, I don't know that, you know, the picking the, the nitty-gritty of the language is really the argument here. It's really what, what Dodd-Frank was meant to address and um, certainly, you know, single securities backed by one loan was not, not really within the realm of what Dodd-Frank was meant to address with the rest retention rules. We've been hearing a lot about how uh, the P2P lending space um, is really 
full of startups trying to do what the traditional banks aren't doing. Is there a regulatory reason why the traditional banks can't enter this space? And do you expect maybe they will and, and um, provide some competition? I, I can address that um, from the standpoint of the, uh, the loans that are being made you know, from like the Prosper and Lending Club loans at the $35,000 unsecured level, the banks aren't interested in doing that because they can't underwrite those loans profitably. So it takes too much trouble for them to go through their processes and do it. So with the platforms in place, they're going through that process and they actually have to meet the requirements of the banks because there is a bank at the front end who's actually issuing the paper. But the, the banks in general, don't, they're not built for that. So what's interesting, though, is what we're seeing is um, these platforms are starting to team up with banks and they're trying to figure out a way, the banks are trying to figure out a way how to participate. And I think from the community banking space, a lot of these community bankers really aren't paying attention or as much attention to the P2P space. They're kind of, um, in some ways, they have their heads in the sand and they're ignoring it and they're just coming around to realizing that not only are they interested in the unsecured $35,000 you know, maximum loans, but now the next step is they're getting into commercial loans. And the commercial loans are going to be in direct competition with the banks. But the real question is, how are the banks going to be able to offer those products profitably? And so when you get into that direct competition, the banks have the heavier infrastructure cost and the the processing cost, and if you can drive that down, then it's going to be a matter of who's going to offer the best service. So if you're a business and you can get a loan in you know, a matter of days versus going the bank route and it's going to take you, you know, a month to get through loan committee and all of that, then that's going to drive people to the platform side. So it's, it's really in, in some ways a matter of um, you know, where, the, where the banks are, are really built to serve and where their focus is. And, when the, the platforms get into direct competition with the banks, how they will respond. Now, one thing banks operate under, and, and if you are a registered or traditional bank, um, the, the regulatory aspects of being a bank are, uh, are extremely overwhelming. Um, you, you generally have to deal with risk-based capital adequacy ratios, uh, holdback ratios, uh, something called RWA, risk-weighted assets. And, Banks focus their lending capital on clients that are likely to yield uh, profitability in a multitude of businesses. So I worked at, uh, at Citigroup for a while, and uh, what I noticed is that with respect to every transaction we would look at, we would also see uh, what are the other revenue streams and income flows we can get from a certain borrower. Um, and it could be investment banking revenue, it could be trading revenue, it could be transaction services. Um, risk uh, 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 hedging, swap transactions. So the, the consumer borrower has not traditionally been a very profitable place for banks because they're not generally repeat borrowers. They're not high, high dollar value clients uh, in the way that they could use their capital to uh, support other, other types of clients. And so there, there is no restriction on a bank uh, like B of A going in and giving you a $10,000 loan. And in fact, they do do that, and, and Chase, for example, and their private client group uh, have, uh, have lending. City has uh, private client lending all the time. Uh, you don't hear about it because it's not something that's in a peer-to-peer -peer online format. But for them to really get into this business, I think they're going to have to um, scale up and, uh, and probably partner right now with, uh, with, with someone who has an online presence. Yeah, I just have a quick related question to that. Do you think that, um, you know, we, we've been hearing a lot about now all of these, these new kind of platforms using all these alternative data to, um, to, to make their decisions. Um, and do you think that, that banks are going to start to get into that? Or is there any kind of, um, you know, are there certain regulations and, and certain laws that they have to look at when determining who's creditworthy that they probably won't be able to compete in that space? Yeah, I can take that one, and I, there's no clear answer, but banks or online lenders or whoever, they are all subject to certain regulations such as, I'm sorry, I can't see you asked the question, but certain to su <laughs> questions such as, uh, 
uh, Equal Opportunity to Credit Act and types of, so it is gonna be very interesting to see because as you've mentioned, that there is a lot of data. There's a lot of data that you can glean from a borrower from their Facebook profile, for example. And so, um, you know, it's unfair to try to put a big broad strokes on this, but you know, as people start looking at more of this data, that's definitely a question that people will need to answer is, you know, what's, what data is usable and you know, what, what crosses the line for certain. Is that gonna be, is that related to the law? I mean, there's a law gonna have to, you know, do they have to open it up and say banks could actually look at Facebook and look at social media? Well, the, the law is it's not bank specific. It's, oh, okay. it's a lending law. Oh, okay. it's, so it's gonna apply to all, all these, all, any lender. Um, whether or not the law adapts and says that you can start using or make safe harbors for using certain types of data, I, I highly doubt it. And um, maybe that's kind of reason why lawyers have jobs is, you know, as platforms come online and say, look, there's this great source of data out there, I really want to use it to underwrite. Um, you know, we can help you kind of understand, does, does your use of that data violate any of these applicable laws? Uh -huh. My question is again regarding security law. Uh, okay, uh, companies like Prosper and uh, Lending Club, they issued uh, uh, loan dependent notes. Okay, we can argue is it asset backed or not asset backed, but it definitely uh, registered security. And uh, the firms sell this registered security to public in the mass. Okay, the first question how this firm exempt to be registered as an investment firm. And the second question, how they exempt to be registered as a mutual fund because the bunch of the investor who invest in this loan is definitely unaccredited investors. I can try to take that. So um, I, if I understood your question, um, you're asking uh, how, is, how is the platform uh, not an investment company that has to register um, like a mutual fund? And how is it not an investment advisor? Um, so on the, those are both excellent, excellent questions. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, on the Investment Company Act, the Investment Company Act is, is a statute that um, basically was designed to regulate mutual funds, and it puts a bunch of substantive um, uh, limitations on the way a mutual fund can conduct its business. For example, um, related party transactions, uh, the use of leverage, um, uh, independent boards of directors and a whole host of other substantive requirements that would not um, fit at all with the way a platform wants to operate as a business. So it's crucial for a platform um, not to be, not to have to register uh, as an investment company uh, and crucial for any fund for that matter that is designed to invest in uh, platform securities not to have to register as an investment company. And there are a handful of ways to do that. Um, the simplest way um, that those of you coming from the, the hedge fund or private equity fund world will, will be familiar with is the so-called 3C7 exemption in which all of your investors are qualified purchasers, basically meaning they have $5 million of, of investable assets. And the SEC says that if you're that wealthy, either as a, as a, as a human being, it's $5 million, as an institution, it's $25 million. If you're that wealthy, you're sort of deemed to be sophisticated enough not to need the protections of the Investment Company Act and all its regulations. Um, that can work for a fund, 3C7. That's still a very typical way to go. Um, for a platform itself um, to assure itself that it's not an investment company, um, 3C7 um, won't work unless it wants to limit all of its note purchasers to qualified purchasers, and that's probably not realistic. It doesn't really go with the semi-retail feel of what a platform is trying to do. So um, you might have uh, an exemption. There's an exemption um, for uh, consumer loans, depending, that's the so-called 3C4 exemption. And depending on the nature of the borrower base, um, that might or might not be available. Uh, and then the, the last exemption, there, there are a host of others. There are real estate exemptions. There are uh, factoring exemptions. So there are a bunch that might conceivably be available, depending on the nature of the borrower base. And then there's a more fundamental uh, argument that the platform can make, which is that um, it's just not an investment company. An investment company is uh, defined as uh, someone who holds, um, trades, acquires uh, securities, um, and that, that's its business. 
and uh, there's an exemption built into the statute that says if your primary business is something other than that, then you by definition are not an investment company. So I think implicitly probably a lot of platforms are taking that tack, uh, or at least if challenged on some of the other exemptions they might be using, their ultimate fallback will be that so-called 3B1 exemption, which is that I'm primarily not um, an accumulator and holder and trader of, ass of, of security assets, loan assets. I'm an online matching service. And yes, I wind up holding loans on my balance sheet. Loans for this purpose are securities in Investment Company Act land. Yes, I do hold loans on my balance sheet, but that's kind of an incidental byproduct of the real um, matching function I'm, I'm performing. So, but it's, 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 it's a wonderful question. It's one that hasn't been fully, fully tested as far as I know. I'll just throw on to that. Actually, I'll ask Brian the question is that, you know, another aspect of that is because it's a platform that's issuing securities and you have employees out there soliciting these investments, would I need to register? Does the platform need to register as a broker dealer? And, you know, Excellent but. question, sir. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, if you look at Lending Club Cross for most of the platforms, the invest, the, 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 the test is, is are 40% of your assets uh, held as investment securities? Uh, borrower payment dependent notes are actually issued by subsidiaries of Lending Club and Prosper. So uh, these aren't really assets that uh, the companies hold. They're investments in the company from outside investors. I don't know if that makes sense. So, so they're not an investment company in the sense that they hold MasterCard and Visa and, and Amex stock and what have you. And then if they get a, a, enough of an accumulation, then they'd have to register. They're, um, they're really a serial issuer. Uh, they should be called an issuer company or something like that. But, um, but that's, that's the structure. Um, in terms of broker-dealer, if you're affecting transactions uh, on behalf of another, uh, and you're in the business of affecting transactions on behalf of another in securities, uh, that is the definition of a broker, and you have to register as a broker-dealer. Um, again, Lending Club Prosper and most of the platforms that you see are issuing their own securities. They are issuer-based securities. They are not issuing securities. They are not selling securities uh, uh, on behalf of another. So a borrower is not coming to them, and you don't see Lending Club marketing securities uh, of a different issue where they're marketing securities of themselves, right? They're issuing borrower payment dependent notes of Lending Club. Uh, now maybe it's Lending Club uh, uh, series 48,241, uh, but that's a Lending Club subsidiary security. And so um, there was a little bit of uncertainty about this and uh, the law seemed very clear, but there's also this notion, especially you run into a lot in peer to peer, of are the platforms being too cute, right? Are we taking old world rules applying new world facts, or were they doing something on just such a mass scale that it can't possibly apply and this exemption can't apply? Uh, and so thanks to platforms like AngelList and Funders Club, uh, they wrote to the SEC for a no action letter uh, and got a favorable ruling that if you are structuring your investments as investments in yourself uh, and there are securities issued by you yourself or an affiliate, um, that again, you qualify for the issuer security exemption rule from the broker-dealer rules. So even though they may have a much higher volume of securities running through their platform than many registered broker-dealers, and I'm certain they do, um, they do qualify as, as exempt from, from registering as a broker-dealer. So, so how, could you maybe just lie, lie out, like as a startup, you're, you know, you're starting out, you may be, you know, you're maybe team three, three, three guys or women or whatever, and then you, you know, you maybe you raise a million dollars, but how do you, What's the effective path forward to like when you first start out? You, you first have to kind of prove out that your model, whatever you're doing, works. And then how do you, is it okay for a while to not have any registration until you said like, at what point does the SEC start caring, saying now, now you're actually, issue, you're doing so much volume, you have to register. Is that on day one or is that like when you're doing like 10 millions or, and, and how do you approach that? What's, what's the game plan? So, there, so there's, there's, again, you know, sort of the three pillars of peer to peer, right, that you have to worry about. What is my borrower legal situation? Do I need a bank or can I issue loans on my own? If you're going out commercially, um, you may need a license in certain areas, but you probably don't need a real bank to be your bank of record. Um, on the consumer side, uh, it's probably a different story. You probably do need a bank. Second is, what am I selling? If I'm issuing loans and I'm, and I'm then having investors come to my site and buy these loans, um, 
you can probably bypass SEC registration for life um, if you are either selling whole loans, which are not securities, uh, or you're onboarding borrowers through exempt private placements. And thanks to the Jobs Act Title II, uh, you're now allowed to advertise private placements. And the big worry up until 2012 was that private placements uh, had to be sort of closed door uh, meetings. Uh, you couldn't advertise a private placement. Uh, it had to be something that you, know, you had a pre-existing relationship with a sophisticated investor. Well, Title II has really opened the door to the online world and sort of unwittingly allowed a, a, a whole crowdfunding environment to thrive because you can now advertise private placements. Yes, you can only go to accredited investors. Uh, the SEC estimates accredited investors are about 7% of the U.S. population, um, but it's the right 7% if you're looking for people who have the money. Um, and if you stick to accreds or you stick to whole loans, uh, you will never need to file an S-1. Uh, now, Lending Club and Prosper are going after a wider demographic. They're going after the general public. And so that's why they're forced into the registration mode, because they're making a distribution to non-accredited investors, people in the general public. Now, there is a rule, Title III, uh, which will allow you to solicit investments from the general public without filing an S-1. Uh, the rules have been proposed by that. They are not yet law. There's a lot of controversy around Title III, because when it came out of the Senate, um, it was uh, severely uh, chopped in half in terms of what the intent was from the founders. And um, so people, there are people who view, think that Title III is really not usable because uh, you can only raise a million dollars. You can only go to, uh, you have to make an SEC filing. Uh, you have strict what we call IPO liability, Section 11, Section 12 liability for misstatements. Uh, you have to use a funding portal or an intermediary. All these different requirements are layered in to go out to the general public, and if only you wanted, and if you had enough interest from accreds, just go with the accreds, and that's generally our advice to folks. Um, the other thing that's happening is that Congress is, uh, there's now a bill in the House Finance Committee to introduce a revised form of Title III. So while the SEC is working on Title III and finalizing the rules, and they had this 580-page release where they uh, went into and, and asked, I, they asked about over 200 questions in the release just to, to the general public. Um, there is a, a new bill which will say instead of one million, it should be five million. And instead of uh, filing with the SEC, you don't have to file with the SEC. Uh, and, and, and significantly weakening the funding portal language so you don't have to go through FINRA. You can actually register with the SEC as a funding portal. Um, I doubt if that gets traction that the SEC will go ahead and approve rules that are tighter than the proposed rules for a revised Title III uh, because you'll create this dynamic where Section 4 will be amended by Congress to allow for an exemption that is not allowed by the SEC rulemaking that's supposed to follow Section 4. So, um, you know, the SEC can be as, as tight as the Jobs Act, but if the Jobs Act goes wider than the SEC, um, that's an untenable situation. There'll be a lot of uncertainty because people will say, well, I don't comply with the SEC rules, but I comply with Section 4A6 which is what Congress just pushed out. And obviously, SEC is created by Congress. So uh, I assume they win that race. But again, there's uncertainty there. I don't know if you guys have a view. Hmm. I, don't, I don't have a view on that. But I think maybe just if I could just kind of address your question maybe a little, a little more pointedly uh, in the sense that, yes, you've got three people. You're going to start an online lending platform. You're going to make loans. And you're going to take in money. Like kind of when should you start caring about a lot of this? Because it is a barrier to entry. It costs money to hire a lawyer. My personal, and don't take this as you know, formal legal advice, but don't mess up on the borrower side. Don't go start making loans to consumers and getting into that trap and because you got a lot of liability there. But when you're taking in money, if it's friends and family, like you know, I think you can't, you, I'm not saying don't register, don't care about the securities law, but you know, if you have to err on one side or the other, um, don't mess up on the borrower side. That's my, would be my advice. <laughs> I, I was wondering, moving to some of the data providers or the aggregators that we've seen here, uh, you know, some of them are opting to become uh, RIAs. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? And, you know, what what would precipitate them to do that? I can. So, uh, an RIA is a registered investment advisor. Again, if you're being compensated to advise somebody or or effectively buy securities for another. Um, and you meet the filing thresholds, then you 
should or must register as a registered investment advisor. Uh, there are various requirements on investment advisor registration. In the state of California, um, if, you're register, if you're advising uh, $1 for compensation uh, of the assets of another, then the state requires you to register as an investment advisor, provided you're advising one on securities. And the question is, if you're only in loans, you know, are those securities? Um, California provides a private advisor exemption uh, where you can file for the exemption and not have to go through the registration process. Oddly, in California, uh, there is a written test that if you go through the Registered Investment Advisor Program, you have to take this test. Um, on the federal level, registration is permitted starting at $100 million and required at $110 million. Um, there are exemptions in the federal laws with respect to registration if you're managing real estate assets uh, or other types of exempt security assets uh, where you can go up to $150 million before you have to fully register as a registered investment advisor. But the key is that you're managing investment in securities for somebody else. So if you find that you're in a situation where you're receiving instructions to put yourself into uh, uh, certain investments, uh, for example, if you have a platform which says, I will go on to Lending Club, uh, use your API to buy loans on your behalf with your instructions, um, you're likely a, a registered investment advisor. Um, if you're in a state like New York, which doesn't have a state RAA regime, uh, then registration starts at 25 million uh, assets under management, uh, and you only have to go through the federal program. So like I said, there's no state uh, written exam in, uh, in New York. There's, there's an interesting question as to, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious that if, you're, if you've started a fund and you're the advisor to the fund or you're the GP for the fund and you're, you're making investment decisions on behalf of your LPs, then you're an, you're an advisor. And unless you're able to claim an AUM-based registration exemption like Brian was just describing, you have to register with the SEC. What's kind of a more interesting question and, and um, uh, uh, one that I, I, I'm, I'm sort of constantly bemused by is whether the platform itself uh, is in the investment advice business. Uh, for example, by means of having uh, r recommendations on its, on its website, recommendations to, to investors in the form of, of ratings that have been assigned to the different loan requests or uh, in, in, in the sense that, it, uh, that the site says we have uh, vetted uh, loans according to the following criteria and the only ones you're going to see on this site are those that have sort of made it through this filter. Query whether that amounts to offering investment advice to your borrower universe, to your lender universe in connection with uh, the sale of, of, of securities, which, um, which we're assuming the, the, the notes or the fractionalized loans are. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's kind of an interesting question. I think it's, it's possible that to the extent a platform went kind of too gung-ho on the rating or recommendation um, front, that it could be seen as uh, engaged in the business of pro providing investment advice for compensation in the form of origination or servicing fees. For us. Have you guys seen anything like that happen yet? I think that's kind of the, the, it, the is the platform an, inv, an, an investment advisor uh, is a question that's kind of not, um, not really been explored by the SEC at this point yet. It's kind of a sleeping dog. Yeah. Uh, I think that as the process becomes more institutionalized and funds get created um, to invest in the space, then it's going to become less of a practical big deal because a lot of those uh, institutions are going to be already uh, registered or expecting registration. I mean, the, the, the platforms themselves have scoring systems, and uh, neither Lending Club nor Prosper are registered investment advisors, and they're not under the radar by any means. So um, I think if they went even further uh, in, in Scott's analysis and, and actually uh, started to uh, engage in, in more aggressive sales tactics than you'd find a situation because everyone who's on these platforms has an account with, uh, with Lending Club or Prosper um, and most of these service providers are managing your own accounts so um, it, it is possible that that could happen. Yeah. It would be probably it would be a way to get to them if there was no other way.
question about fund structure. Uh, you were talking about funds being created in order to pool investors who then would invest into the notes or loans on the platforms. How's everyone dealing with the valuation issues associated with the assets that are purchased and now held in a fund? So the, the, um, on, on the valuation side, essentially uh, each of the funds have their methodology for valuing those. And you know, essentially it's taking into consideration uh, anticipated default rates, the uh, you know, interest rates, and then doing some sort of a discounted cash flow back to come up with those uh, valuations. And so from the, the standpoint of uh, when we get involved from the audit standpoint, we look at their valuation methodology. I mean, they're all level three assets. And you know, there's more than one way to come up with a, with a valuation. And so we look at the, um, the way that they're valuing it. Um, we also work with our valuations group to uh, determine, you know, are they using an acceptable methodology within the, you know, the framework, uh, evaluation framework. And, you know, as long as they're within the parameters and they're applying that valuation, you know, consistently, then, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be okay on the valuation side. Now, uh, agree with Mike, we're, we're looking at the valuation policy that they're coming up with, doing a review. We're having calls with the, the auditors to make sure that they're on board with it make sure that what we're doing on a monthly basis is going to hold up at the, at the year end. But yeah, and I think that, you know, as you're starting the funds, what's important is that you, you know, have a conversation with your accountants and make sure that they're going to be on board with the methodology that you're using. And we've had those conversations before uh, loans have, you know, before they've actually started buying loans, um, you know, to make sure that we're going to be on board with the methodologies that they're going to be rolling out. And it's, it's good to get everybody on the same page, you know, rather than getting down the path and then having the accountants say, well, wait a minute, we don't like that. Just a quick follow-up. Um, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people who say, well, wait a minute, these are three-year loans, they're short-term. Why can't I just say the value is the stated amount? Why do I have to go through a fair value procedure? Well, unfortunately, uh, that's what the accounting requires, is that you have to uh, fair value them. And inherent in the loans, you know, there are some losses, and you know, those are borne out by just looking at the history for, uh, if you look at Lending Club or Prosper's history or any other short-term loan, you know, there are going to be some, some bad ones within there. So you do need to do something to make some assumptions in terms of what those losses are going to be, and it should be based on some inputs that you're, you're getting you know, that are, are reasonable. But, you know, within that, people are, are using different methodologies and they're, you know, some of them are taking a little bit more of a haircut because their, their belief is that, um, you know, they may see higher loss rates, whether it's the economy, uh, unemployment, or, or certain macroeconomic situations. You know, they're, they're putting some assumptions on those. And it's no different than, you know, what banks do when they come up with their allowance for loan losses. Um, even on the short-term loans. You know you have losses baked in there, but you don't know necessarily which loan is going to be the loss. So you're just trying to come up with a, um, you know, a macro level valuation for the, for the entire thing. I think one, uh, you know, for the funds, one of the issues just to throw out there for you that, that we come across is the, the funds are, are relying on the platforms to do the servicing. And one of the things that often gets overlooked is from the accounting and auditing rules, the auditors have to have an understanding of uh, the process that the uh, company is going through and what the controls are. And just because you've essentially outsourced that servicing doesn't mean that you, know, you get a free pass on not having that understanding. And so um, this is a little bit of a point of friction because um, the, uh, as far as the platforms go, you, know, you have to understand what's in place and if they don't have, if they're not getting a, a controls report, you know, SOC 1 report, then the auditors are going to have to do something to get comfortable with what's going on. So for example, what we uh, do is uh, we take our uh, portfolio of clients and those that are, if, if, we don't, if we're not getting a SOC 1 report from, or the clients aren't, from uh, the loan originator and, and servicer, then 
we're going out and doing procedures to get an understanding of what those controls are at you know the lending clubs and the prospers or having you know their auditors do it so if you're on the platform side and you're going to be selling to funds um, that's an issue that you um, want to make sure that you address is that you're you have the documentation and you're getting that work so that when your hedge funds come to you and say you know what are the controls over this process you have something to give them any other questions I think that's about time anyway. I think um, we went a little bit over and, and we're going to take a little bit of a break upstairs. There's some cookies and brownies being served and um, we'll re resume in about 15, 20 minutes. Thank you guys. That was, that was really great. And oh, but what, what, what was your, you mentioned that paper, what, what booth number? In uh, booth 31, which is 31. Uh, down, down Main Street of the exhibit hall on the left side. And I know, and we've got our articles at booth 29. Okay, <laughs> and I think Sam, I think your white paper is in the uh, media the, uh, executive lounge, which is right downstairs in the in the Franciscan rooms.